Oh, look at you, Gidget. Oh, I love my work. You picked the wrong time to buy an apartment. The espresso beans mean health, wealth, and um, happiness. I can't control my genius. I'm not some boorish natural like that hat Cosgrove. I'm an artist, okay? It must mean something. Well, our worst fears lie in anticipation. But that's not me. That's Balzac. She smiles. Hello, patio. We had a misunderstanding. Oh, don't bother with dinner. We got Chinese takeout. Listen, Marty needs me to look over this work. Don't wind up for me. I love you too. Welcome to a very special episode of Mad Men Men. Now, we just did our episode on We Small Hours, which was the final episode featuring Salvatore Romano played by Brian Batt. I'm going to have to explain this episode that you're about to listen to. It does require a little bit of a preamble, but I'll try to be brief. So essentially, we thought, uh, Michael and I thought, it would be really fun if we could surprise Will with a surprise appearance of Brian Bat on this show. So instead of uh, moving on to the next episode in season three, amazingly enough, Brian Bat uh, was actually available to come and talk to us about the show. And that's what you're about to listen to. Now, when this starts, I'll explain what's going on because this is not a video thing. And so it might be a little confusing. So I'll paint the scene. I'll do my best to dictate the screenplay as it were to you all. So essentially, we were in the recording room for the show. And the way this works is that we're all in this room. It's a browser window and Brian has the time allotted and everything like that. And Will has, again, has no idea that Brian is going to be coming onto the show. He thinks that we're going to be talking about the season three finale, which, you know, of course we record these episodes ahead of time. Anyway, so we're all just sort of chatting and Will thinks that Mike and I are delaying for the sake of delaying, I guess. And uh, in actuality, we're waiting for Brian to be ready on his end because we are going to invite him into the studio and And so essentially, he's just going to show up right in front of Will. And the way it happened is that we were all kind of talking. And of course, I hit the record button because I want this whole thing to be recorded. Will sees that we're recording and then he's like, oh, we're recording. And then there you go. That's the setup. And then everything you're going to hear is Will, Mike, mine and Brian's all our honest reactions to everything that's happening. So there you go. Enjoy this episode. It was a really great conversation we had with Brian about the show. Hope to do more stuff like this in the future if the opportunity comes across. And thank you all so much for listening. It's because of our listeners and subscribers and the interest in this podcast that we have the opportunity to to talk to people who actually were on the show. We'd love to do more of it. So without further ado, here is our Mad Men Men episode with Brian Bat. Welcome to Mad Men Men, the show... <laughs> I am so oh. sorry. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I'm running around like a madman. And I just ran in from the doctor. I have, to have surgery on my foot. I am so sorry. I, so. Brian, no worries at all because this was the perfect way to do it. Because we've just been chatting yeah. here with Will, who had no idea you were coming. Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? So I'm nice sorry. Good. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, Will, this is a surprise for Will. And um, we were just kind of waiting, like, the perfect moment to bring you in. So thank you. Cool. Hey, Will. Hey, good to meet you. Thanks for coming on. No problem. No, I'm, I'm glad. In fact, I've read something. Something just came across my Instagram of something about John saying, you know, he would never rule out the possibility of doing a reboot or revisiting <laughs> the show. So, you know. That oh, that must have stopped you in your tracks. Well, <laughs> who knows? I, you know, everywhere I go, people ask me, you know, what happened to Sal? What happened to Sal? And, and I think people, God, they want to know. So it would be, it would be fun. I would, I would say yes, of course, because it was like the best thing in the world to do. I loved every second of it. Right off the bat. I mean, right, I off say, the bat. right off the bat. Right off the bat. Sal, Salvador Romano is a hundred percent my favorite character on the show without exception. Oh, thank and, you. And I, as these two guys would know, I did not personally believe that that was the last time we saw the character. Like, I was like, surely they're going to bring him back. He's like the best, you know, like where we tried to explain it to Will gently. Yeah. So did I. So So welcome to to Mad Men Men. We're we're already recording and uh, we'll try to be respectful of your time. Just happy to chat with you and 
As long as you want to, all I'm doing is putting up a Christmas tree. Wonderful. Getting it early. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Brian Bat, before Thanksgiving Christmas tree guy. <laughs> Interesting. The more I have to explain, I have to explain myself. My husband and I have a home furnishings and a gift shop here in New Orleans. And once Thanksgiving hits, it's insanity. We can't do anything. And all we want to do is come home after work and drool in a cup. So it's, or drink. And so nothing gets done. So everything has to get done before Thanksgiving. So that's kind of why. We're usually, a, you know, more traditional in, in other aspects, but no, the tree goes up. You gotta say, of uh, that's the best explanation I've ever heard for someone putting it up early. You know, that's, <laughs> if anyone gets a pass, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, you know, we opened this shop called Hazelnut. We named it after my grandmother. Her name was Hazel and she was a nut. And my, uh, <laughs> Tom did this kind of work on, on Madison Avenue for years. And 20 years ago, it's 20 years ago, you know, a Broadway show I was supposed to do fell through. That's mainly what I did before Broadway and off-Broadway theater. And it fell through and that we did the recording. We did all this stuff and it, it ended up not happening at this time. And we've been talking about it. Tom had done the business plan and we, everything fell into place. We opened up the shop and it was a success. And it's been a success even through Katrina and the pandemic and all this shit. And it was the most freeing thing to do something else outside of show business. And I'm convinced the reason why I got Mad Men is because we just opened the shop. We got back after Katrina. We were just, you know, dug our heels in and more. And I, show business wasn't ruling my life anymore. And I seriously, I was in rehearsal for a play in New York, went in and read and they called the next day and said, you got it. It was, you know. I went on my lunch break and it was, it was, and and then who knew, you know, no one knew what it was going to be. We shot the pilot, had a great time. And it was a year later before we started filming the series out in LA, but it was, you know, and even then we were like, is anyone going to see this? It's on AMC that, you know, but <clears throat> thank God for the critics and, you know, the media that really basically said, you got to watch this, you know? Yeah, I remember and uh, around that time, a lot of us didn't even know what the show kind of was. <laughs> we, were, we were a little bit like, you know, I was uh, studying advertising at the time when I was in uh, I was in college. So I was, that's how I was watching the show. And the whole construct of this podcast is that I watched it many, many times over the years. Mike here watched it while it was airing. And mm -hmm. Will here is watching it for the first time. Ever. Ah. Yeah. So we're going to be really careful not to spoil it. We're, we try to be careful not to spoil things for Will. It's happened a couple times. Though, well, where are you? Where are you in this series? So we are, we literally just put out our episode talking about We Small Hours. So your final episode, the timing of it, actually, it's like a little scary how it worked out that we were able to arrange this with you literally the same week that we put that episode out. Oh, wow. How oh, perfect. You know, that episode aired the night after Christina Hendricks' wedding in New York, that we were at her wedding, it's very wow. small wedding. Unfortunately, unfortunately, she and Jeffrey have divorced, but she's engaged again to a wonderful guy, and um, George. And but I will never forget because I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't tell anyone about what was happening. My family it was it was very 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 difficult. In fact, my mom, who was battling cancer at the time, came out for the third season premiere. Flew her out to come out and do the come see the red, do the red carpet thing. And, and that day that I went, you know, the day of that third premiere, the third season premiere was one of my final days of shooting of, of that, that very episode. And we were running late and I had the car pick her up at the hotel and bring her to the studio so I could get ready and it would go right to the, and literally we had just wrapped, just wrapped and because they wouldn't let her in to see anything because it was too, you know, we were, it was very, very tight lipped, this set. We couldn't talk about anything or, or discuss it. And I did not. I, I, but yeah, it was, it was, I, I remember that day clearly. So, what's it like, you know, finding out that Sal's leaving? What was that process like? How far ahead did you know? It was devastating. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. There are some big blows in my life. And, and that was one of them. You know, I'm not, you know, there, it was a different kind of, I, I didn't see it coming. That's the whole thing. It was one of these blindsiding, you know, moments. I, I did not see it coming. And of course, I was in denial because I thought, well, I can come back. And they, everyone did say, you can come back. You can come back. But I, when I realized, the odd thing was, I was in New Orleans, because like, like I said, my mom was going through chemo and all this stuff. So when I wasn't filming, if I had several days off or a nice stretch, 
I would jump on a plane and come here. And I get a call saying, you know, Matt wants to see you in the office. Can you come on down to the set? And I'm like, well, not really. I'm kind of in New Orleans right now, but I can come on up, you know. And, you know, very few people have been called to the office. <laughs> and then Matt got on the phone and, and said, you know, you're going to be, you know, writing your, your character is going to be fired, blah, 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 but you can come back. And I, I really was just freaked out. I, and, you know, I, I held, held on to the hope that I would come back. What was really odd is my last day of shooting, you know, when someone is, usually it was you know, a recurring part or a guest star or something, you know, when they finish, when their arc is finished and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're written, that's the end of it. They do a little celebration on set and, and or if we got close to them, we'd go out that night. And because it was so, so dangling, because it was in the middle of the season and we didn't know what was going to happen, I technically could come back, but, you know, they did this, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brian Down, like, oh, oh. And it was kind of, it was a little heartbreaking. Rich Summer was the only guy who was available. He goes, come on, we got to go get a drink. You know, let's go have a drink. And he goes, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, you know. And it was kind of hard. The last, the last table read of that season, you usually get the scripts a little bit in advance, you know, but because, you know, when it push comes to shove, they have to, you know, the, writer, the writers are doing as, going as quick as they can. And literally, it was the day before this last episode was shooting that the script, the table read was happening and the script had just come out that day. They called us, everyone to the, to the, off, to the table read. And myself and Michael Gladys were the two people that had been, you know, written off, you know, and we're flipping through the script. Everyone's flipping through the script to see if we come back. And it was like, oh, yeah, but so, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, I wouldn't trade a moment for it because still to this day, people come up and say how much they love Sal. And uh, and it was just a joy to work on and still have great friends, you know, from the show. And it was just a gift that I'll be forever grateful for. That's great to hear. And, you know, I know you've been up to a lot since then. You've been doing stage work. You've been in theater for decades. We we did see that you you just had a uh, an off Broadway play that came out very recently, right? Pay the writer, pay the writer with yes, with the lovely Marsha Cross and, and and Ron Canada, and it was really fun. It was a limited run. It was it, it was an, an, a, quite an experience uh, for a new play to be done off Broadway in New York at the Signature to have three just three weeks of rehearsal. It was because of scheduling. Everyone we only had three weeks of rehearsal, one week of previews, and then we opened which is unheard of. It's usually five weeks of rehearsal, at least two weeks of previews. And then, and we had so many setbacks. Our wonderful director, Karen Carpenter. Yeah, she's heard all the jokes. The first day of tech fell off the stage and shattered her ankle. So she had to be gone for the first couple of days of tech and then came back in a wheelchair on Percocet to finish directing the show. And there was all these changes. Every day, something was rewritten. One of Marsha and my scenes were rewritten, I think, eight times. And it was it was it was a challenge. And it was you know, I I loved it. But it, it, was, it was we all had a good time. The audiences really liked it. Unfortunately, the critics were a little. They liked the actors, but the play they thought needed some work. So who knows? You know, you you can't judge everything by what a critic says. You have to go see it yourself and. And experience the play or the film or the TV show and make your own conclusions. Yeah, I've only ever done kind of like a live sort of thing uh, personally. So I can't even, the energy of the room is everything, honestly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it is fun. I do, I do love the theater. I do. That's where I started and it's great. But I will tell you, the, the, in film and television, having the weekend off, you know, is kind of, lovely and normal that you can have you know no one gets married on a monday that's when you're off in the theater you know no no big event happens on a monday you you're at you know the rest of the time saturday you do two shows on saturday some uh, definitely a, a matinee on sunday or two shows on sundays so it's you know it's give and take you know every 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 act will say but the stage the stage and i do love the stage but i do love film and television well, I know you're you're not prepared for this, but we want to make sure you have a chance to. <laughs> we wanted yeah, to give you some time, you know. Come on, to, Will. To, 
Yeah, yeah. But if you had anything, you can always step in. I don't want to, you know. Well, I mean, if you're still processing. That, yeah, that is true. I'm still not even sure if this is actually happening. But, <laughs> but I did want to ask, like, because we I, not to jump back, but I was curious, like, in if you had like a head cannon for like what happened to Salvatore Romano. I mean, there might be something in the show that talks about him later, but I was curious just from your perspective, like from this point forward, what's Sal doing? Like, where does his life go? I kind of oh. want that closure for myself, partly. So, we well, you know it could go, knowing Mad Men, it would be sad, but I'm not a sad person. So I think Sal finally realizes, you know, his true, true self and falls in love, divorces Kitty, and they've remained really great friends. They've had, they have a child. And he's off in Fire Island on the caftan having a great time. One of the writers, one of the advisors, too, on the, uh, on the show, some of Sal's life was based on his, his experience. He was in advertising. He was, you know, married, had children, and then realized he was gay, left the wife and went with his partner, and they're all great friends. So it was kind of, that's, that's the image that I'd like to see, you know. I like that a lot. I hopefully, you know, since you were talking, hey, if a revival re- reboot or reunion or something ever happens, it sounds like you already got a little bit of a baseline there. So, <laughs> well, you know, whatever Matt is going to come up with is going to be like two million times better than what I just did. So, I mean, it's going to be so much richer. And then you could just do better call call Saul <laughs> Sal. Yeah, better call better Sal. Call Sal. <laughs> I, I did have an idea for a spinoff called My Pal Sal. You know, so ooh, I mean. Please go on. <laughs> My pal. That's about it. That's just what he, <laughs> he becomes a theater director in New York. He starts directing commercials, then he gets into directing theater. Yeah. Well, yeah, you have that line of like, oh, maybe you'll get into movies, you know, he mm-hmm. says. So mm-hmm. hey, it's, it's already set up. I am curious about that, though. You know, you have this head canon about Sal, you know, but you also talk about Matt having his ideas. How much creativity and input do you have, like, overall in the character, in, in scenes and line directions? Nothing, huh? <laughs> it was so brilliantly written that it, it's an actor's dream because you don't have to really, at least I didn't, and a lot of the other characters, we all talked about this, that you're taken care of. I've never felt so taken care of and so respected and so, like, we they put us on a you know, tightrope walking across with them. They'd have the net right underneath us. You know, it was, the writing was so brilliant. There, you, there was no, you know, we didn't have to do any foreshadow we didn't have to do any late you know come putting these little tidbits out there for later because first of all in television i don't know if you know this but my that we don't know at least on our show we only saw the script that we were filming that at that moment so we'd get the script and then the next script would come for the next episode really towards the end of while we were filming the the the, the, the prior one so we really never knew what the arc of the character was, what was going to happen down the line. You know, a lot of times some people, especially less experienced actors, would might play the result. You know, knowing that something is going to happen, it might taint the, the process. But it, it, we, there were certain few things. I remember a scene in season two about the golden... What was it? Was it the the golden had, violin. Violin. And... and, and came over to the Cosgrove, Cosgrove came over to my house for dinner and I was kind of ignoring my wife, Kitty. And there were some lines, and I remember, I think it was the director wanted me to be just angrier at her. And I, 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 I said, I don't feel that. I said, I said, he loved, this is his wife. He does love her. He's, he doesn't even know that he really loves Ken. He's just, it's this natural I'm going to pay attention to him. My wife is right here. And, and, and the pain comes out of his ignoring her unintentionally. And, not, you know, it, it's not an angry maliciousness. And it was one of those times where I, I was like, I really believe this. So they called Matt down and Matt was like, yeah, but that's, that's Brian is right how that should be interpreted. But otherwise, you know, if you, I didn't know this too, going because it was my first series ever. And when you have a question... You ask the writers or the showrunner, the directors, for the most part, on a, on a series, are there really to get the shot and get it on time and get what the, what the creator wants. And as far as plot 
you know, and, and, and intent and line readings. In fact, you go to the writers and the um, showrunner. But it was always so well written. And, and half the time, remember there was a scene when, that I can't remember his name now, but he was, we're in the break room and we're eating donuts. And I can't remember what, what his name was. He was like, I'm homosexual. I can't remember what his accent was. But yeah, I think it's Smitty or Kurt. Smitty. And, 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 yeah, 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 those guys. And everyone's reaction was different. And they wanted a close up on me, just like having, you know, going, oh God, oh God, you know. And I remember thinking we did several takes. I remember Rich eating too many donuts. He was about to throw up because of like, you learn early on, do not really eat what, because you're going to be doing. A, you have like the spit buckets, right? Yes. Yeah. And I remember like, oh, this shot's great. This is the one. I'm feeling it. It's like, it's. Oh, that wasn't the one they used. It was another one that was so much better, you know? So what we think is going to play on screen is not necessarily what the editors and, and the creators are going to find to tell their story. You know, it's. Yeah. I'm, re I'm really glad you mentioned the golden violin scene. Cause that's one of my personal favorite Sal scenes is his reaction to Kitty right after that, where he does sort of react with like genuine, like, oh, I actually feel bad about this. You know, go put your feet up. I'm going to go clean up the kitchen. Okay. And like, there's no falseness to it. Then she's still a little bit hurt, but it's it, that to me is like, that's pure Sal. So I, I love yeah. that. Edit. That's what I mean. I'm, I will say that's kind of me too. If I, if I hurt someone's feelings, if I, whatever, I, genuinely, you know, it, it, I, it's not, I, I'd rather walk a mile on my lips than hurt someone's feelings. I'm just such that that's the way I am. And in, when when she points it out, it just it, it crushed crushed Sal. So that was, you know, and it's, it's, it, that's the one thing, uh, you know. In my life, I was, you know, I had girlfriends. Not that that's what you do and you get married, and then all of a sudden realize at one point, wait, I am gay. Wait, this isn't this isn't. The thing. And I'm I've known so many men that did get married because that's what you did, and there was there was no other outlet. And even in the society that I grew up. In New Orleans, I did not know any gay people. There were no, my parents had no gay friends. I had no gay friends. It wasn't until I did theater that I met gay people. But still to this day, when I you know I meet men that are have, were married and everything, I'm, I look back and I thought, you know, could I have done that? And I, I'm so glad I didn't because it just you know why cause someone else that that pain just to conform to some norm and what is on some norm you know that society imposes but you know, poor sal it's like you know <laughs> just I, I think now i know matt was already leaning towards this but at the end of season one i said you know sal's so closeted he's so closeted he should get married and in the second season my first the first thing is when she, uh, kitty and i are watching the the tour of the white house with uh, jackie and like okay, no way. Well, and she's the best. I'll love her. She said. <laughs> I did want to know, like, once you like, like as you mentioned, it's such a hard blow to kind of be involved with something like this, only to lose it. Were you still able to comfortably watch the show as it was airing, or did you kind of need some time Ooh. away just to kind of process it and then come back to it? To be completely honest, I watched the next season, and then I really didn't watch it until the very, very ending. And then I went back and watched it. It, it was kind of painful. You know, it's, it's, it's like getting kicked off the team or, you know, you break your leg or whatever, you're off the team, you watch your, watch your uh, teammates win, you know, the pennant or whatever. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful being in the first three years because the first three years we won the Emmy and the SAG Awards I think we won the Emmy before season two. And then some shows, it just keeps on going. You know, one of my friends, uh, uh, Michael, who was written off, who's a who, fabulous actor, and he went back on, I think, because I was watching it, because he was on, I think, in the fourth season. He came back as like a Hare Krishna. You know, he, he and he said, because don't do it. If they ask you to do it, it's just too painful. It's like, it's like after you break up with your girlfriend that you really, really love, and you have one more night of sex, and you never, you, it's never going to happen again, and you know it, and it's too painful because it was this magical experience. We had 
We were the little engine that could. We were this little tiny show on a random network that people did watch. And it just went. And then all these award nominations came out and all this press. And, and, and it, was, it was just fantastical. I mean, it's nothing that I've ever experienced before. You know, it, it's, it, was, it was incredible. Yeah, you know, I think that's really apparent as you watch, especially the first three seasons, right? It's like capturing lightning in a bottle. You could tell from the jump that the show is really special. Yeah. I'm curious, as you think back on that time, you know, you know, did you know it from the jump? Or, you know, at what point were you like, oh, we're cooking with fire? You know, it was what happened. Matt showed us, I was in New York, and he was showing us, before we went into production, the pilot. And I was like, wow, this is really good. I just hope people see it. You know, you know, that's, that, you know. And then when we were filming the first season, and it was before we aired, they sent out a DVD to the critics and the media and the press of two of the first two episodes. And believe it or not, there was, there was no opening party planned. There was nothing already planned. And the response was so over the top you know, raves that they quickly put together this really fabulous party. And I think then we knew something was up. And I remember when the nominations, I think the first nominations were like the SAG Awards or, or the Golden Globes, the first season. Because then we had the first strike, the writer's strike, right after we wrapped. And they didn't host, they didn't have the Golden Globes, but John won. John won on Best Actor. And I think we won Best Series. I can't remember. And then they did have the SAG Awards, and we lost because it was the last season of, of Sopranos. But then the Emmys happened, and we won all the Emmys. So it was, it was, it was, then it was just, at, at that moment, like, oh, my God. But my first thing at the Emmys, it was kind of crazy. We went. I was going to wear a red dinner jacket, and Christina Hendricks was like, yeah, that looks great. And then I get this call, and she was like, no, no, don't wear a red, red dinner jacket. All the, all the valets who parked the cars wear red dinner jackets, and it just looked like a valet at the thing. I'm like, thanks, Christina. But it was kind of funny. We were walking, you know, doing the press, and the press rep was taking us you know, to do the red carpet thing, and no one knew who we were. No one really had seen the show. And... One rule of thumb, never follow Heidi Klum down a red carpet. Just, just no, don't do it. We're walking and we get there and they're taking the pictures. And finally, like, like, this is ridiculous. They don't want my picture. They don't want our picture. Let's go stand over here. So we walked over and literally this photographer was screaming at me and some of the other guys like, get out of the way. Get out of the way. You're in my shot. I'm trying to get Heidi. Like, I'm like, and I just like, who, who the hell do you think? He said, who the hell do you think you are? And I'm like, well, I'm on Mad Men. And he's like, eh, whatever. So after the Emmys, we the show won everything. We have to go back. There's all these banks of photographers, the same ones, but but inside, and you talk to them, and it was the same photographer that passed by. Like, how you doing? Yeah, this time they were yelling at Heidi, and oh, uh, it was just it's, it's, it's a it's a God, it's a feeding frenzy. It's you know, it's like throwing a piece of meat into a pool of piranhas. It's crazy. I have a bit of a curveball here. It's, it's a very personal me thing. I'm sure Will and Mike will be like, why even ask? But I really love listening to the DVD commentaries. I like to talk about them here on the podcast. I've never heard them. I, I remember recording them, but I don't, I've never heard them. I've always been really fascinated by them. I, of course, listen to yours for We Small Hours. And it, first of all, I think I mentioned it on the show that it, it was just a really nice conversation. Sometimes I feel like I'm listening to commentaries and it feels like people run out of things to say. <laughs> They're just like, let's just watch the episode. It's it's Mad Men. We're having a great time. But I've always <laughs> been really interested in like what the process of that is, like the timing. Like, I'm sure it's like always kind of a little different, but what, what was your experience doing those? Doing those, they were wild. They were way out in, 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 in the valley and they would play the episode and they would have some ideas of things to talk about, but mainly you just start blabbing. And what stuck, stuck. I can't remember what, what a wee small hours. What, what was that? No, the hobo code was one where that guy tried to pick me up at the at the at the uh, restaurant. Right. That sounds right. Yeah, I remember having some. I remember that because that was a that was the first episode where my character had a, l a little more plot line, and you learned a lot more about him. And I was, to be honest, I was a little terrified. I don't know why. I was just, you know, this. I'm a this is my first TV series and I didn't, you know, 
the best advice I got was from a wonderful actress, a Broadway actress and film actress named Betty Buckley. And um, years ago, I was doing a, cap- a cabaret thing. I was mainly, I did Broadway with her and Sunset Boulevard and stuff. And she said, play the room you're in and take the, and then, and, and I'm really stuck with me because when we did the pilot, I walked on the set and like, like, oh my God, they're not playing around. This is real. And then I met John Hamm and I went, oh God, you know, it, it, character description on the breakdown was the arrow collar man you know this is like i'm like they got it right so thank god the, my first scene was with john because he's such a great guy and such a great actor and he set the tone and all i did was just try to match his level of of energy and and, and volume and you just play that scene with him i mean have you ever seen a film or a tv where someone is like just not doing the same they're not in the same play. They're just unfortunately, they're just, yes. <laughs> and that's um, that is the, like this natural monitor that I try to have to be present at, at that level. Anyway, I was so nervous about that scene. I don't know why. And Janie Bryant is just heaven. I mean, I, I, she's still a dear, dear, dear friend. And she brought my costume. And and they were, I, if you look closely, I'm wearing a little vest, and on the vest are little embroidered fleur de lis. And she goes, "That's for New Orleans." That's because that's one of the symbols of New Orleans. And um, she goes, that's just to make you feel at home. You're the best. But all the guys were filming around the corner because I was supposed to go to that bar and have, and when they were playing, the, let's do the twist. And they're all twisting around. And I was supposed to meet the, the you know, the operator there. Lois, and, yeah. And, yeah, I was, I was, but I ended up going here. And they all came around. The guys came to watch, to cheer me on to film that scene. It was just really, you know, shit like that doesn't happen that often. So it was, there was great camaraderie, especially in the first, first year, in the first, you know, first couple of years, you know, and then, you know, I, it becomes, it becomes your job and, you know, people get press agents and stuff. Like that. But it was the commentary. I, I, I honestly, I hate to say it. I can't remember what I said about the, the commentary, but which one was the We Small Hours? Was that the one that, the, that's season three, right? That's the episode I got. Yeah, that's your last episode, season last three, episode, episode nine. Episode, yeah, episode nine. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was very awkward too because when we were in the the last scene when I'm at the phone booth, you know, it was kind of funny. Some of the extras were like some of the grips, and uh, they put one of the cameramen in the in, you know, black leather whatever outfit. Yeah, we mentioned that you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. I just didn't want it to be tawdry but it was at the, in that era and it still goes on you know have you watched, i don't know if you watch fellow traveler no not fellow traveler yeah fellow traveler is one of them and i just watched a movie an italian film on netflix called nuovo nuovo olimpio oh it's wonderful you know but there were places where men went to get together you know it's still and i don't know if they still do it and in Central Park, but that's the area, you know, that was the rambles that that's where people would go meet. I personally, I mean, I wish your very last scene could have been with like the relax, you know, like where you're kind of looking at your work and that, that to me felt like, wow, this is where this character is going to kind of, you know, but well. Yeah. 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 It also, you know, it does have, you have to show what it was great about Mad Men is it really held up a mirror to society and then said, look, look how, how much we've changed, but look how much we've not changed, and look how far we have to go. Matt once said, "He goes, you can, you, you can dress them up. You can, you know, put all these political correct, you know, thoughts or and, and, and mores around, but the caveman is a caveman. You're not going to change it. You put a bunch of men in a room, and most probably they're going to start talking like they did back in 1955. Anyway, I don't know if those are his words. He said something like, you can't change the caveman,' which is kind of true, you know, in a way." Is that why you think the show has really lasted the test of time? I mean, it finished up, gosh, like eight years ago now, and yeah. people still watch it. People still talk about it. It's it's amazing. I think any show that's really good and is true to itself, the more great thing about it is that Matt was so meticulous about the research and the look, the accuracy of every aspect that you know, it, it pays off. You know, one of the, an interesting tidbit is that right when the writer's strike happened, you know, now there's so much 
product everywhere. But when the writer's strike happened, the networks were scrambling to put other shows on, on, on prime time because there was nothing they could only repeat so much. And they were, it was in negotiation to put Mad Men because it was AMC and no one had really seen it. If, if we were on another network, we would have canceled after the first season because the numbers were very low. And it was between us and Dexter. And, and Dexter ended up being chosen to be put on network television. And the reason we were told that Mad Men was not is because of the smoking. Serial killing's okay, but smoking, right? yeah. that's what's going to get you. <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, it's, it's just, but what I love about the show is like, not too long after the first season, I was asked to sing the national anthem at a, at a Saints game. And I got there early to, you know, to run through, and I've done it several times in different games somewhere on YouTube. And the, it was a janitor cleaning up and going through, and he goes, hey, you're the guy from Mad Men. And I went, and not here I'm thinking, you know, this is this highbrow, you know, show. that I was like, I loved that, you know, everybody was, from every walk of life, was getting something out of it. It wasn't just this, oh, you know, snobby hit. But there are some people, like some people in my family, you know, would like it took them forever to get into it. They're like, it's so slow. I'm like, I'm sorry, things don't blow up in my show. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm, you know there's, there's not a lot of gunfire. You're not chasing, we're not chasing criminals. It's kind of intelligent. You have to pay attention. The show sneaks up on you. Honestly, yeah. I was, I mean, Mike, you were very young when you first saw it. I was like 20 and we were just obsessed. Yeah, I mean, I think I could have done with a Michael Bay directed episode, maybe just one time. <laughs> just one, just one. I mean, I was going to say, you know, you know, cars may not blow up or anything, but, you know, relationships blow up, you know, like there's yeah. a ton of, you know, humanity blow up. Yeah. Just not the, the physical kind. <laughs> they really created such, you know, it was, it was true to the period. I mean, yes, it was so misogynist and homophobic. And it was, it was a, you know, white, you know, white christian or whatever you want to say you know anglo-saxon it was a white man's world you know that was it in the, in the first episode when he was with, with the, the the um the apartment store and then the meeting is do we have any jews work here and he's like he and once his name said i said not on my watch i'm like oh you know that just like hit, killed me when i first heard it but it you know it's it's true and a lot of the problems people had were, you know, some people were offended or you didn't like them. They're like, you can't project the morality of today on the past. It doesn't work. It looks stupid. I mean, I came a of the series after Mama they did on network and it was maybe the Playboy. There was something like the Playboy company. There was something about stewardesses and it was set in the sixties and everything. And no Can one, am, I think smoking. Something like that. Yeah. No one was smoking. There was no, you know, drinking at the office. It was just, no, that, I remember when I was a kid going to the dentist or the doctor, and there was one of those standalone ashtrays every so often in the waiting room. You know, it's, it's gone now, but this is what, what happened. I mean, that was one problem with the show, though. It kind of started everyone smoking because we were smoking those herbal cigarettes and on set. And maybe I'm just an addictive soul, but we would come off, come out of the out of the sound stage and go, "Does anyone have a cigarette?" And then we'd start smoking, real. And like by the first season, I would bum the cigarettes. That I didn't want to buy a pack. Second season, I'd buy a pack, and it would last you know, almost a week. Third season, almost a pack a day. <laughs> it was ridiculous. And thank God, when I was written off the show, my husband can't stand cigarette smoke, so. I put them down and I haven't had one since. So that was quite a while ago. There's like at least one silver lining from the year to time. Exactly. Off the show. <laughs> I might still be smoking. You know, it was just a couple of years. So hopefully, hopefully. And I, you know, we're obviously a Mad Men podcast. We're talking a lot about Mad Men, but I'm curious, you know, since your, your, your time on Mad Men, what's been the project you've been most proud of? What's, what's, what gets you the most excited? You know, it's something I'm in the middle of right now. I wrote a play called Dear Mr. Williams, and it's my story of growing up in New Orleans, also, but also told through Tennessee Williams' words. So I go back and forth between Tennessee Williams and, 
is just done with lighting and projections. And we have producers that are moving it to New York, hopefully in the spring off Broadway. So keep your eyes and peel because it, 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 we did it down here right after theaters, you know, theaters started opening up in 21 in the fall. And we've had to wait to get the rights from the Tennessee Williams estate for this entire time because one third of the, the writing is are his quotes from all different things, from plays, movies, interviews, poetry, you name it. And it just weaves into my little story of, you know, getting out of New Orleans and becoming an actor. But my favorite, one of my favorite quotes that I found of his buried, buried in his, his, in his notebooks is, um, you reach a point in your life when, when you look in the mirror and what you see is all you are ever going to be. Now, either you accept that or you kill yourself or you stop looking in mirrors, <laughs> which I kind of just love that. Wow. Isn't that kind of, it's kind of, here's your choices. But anyway, it's that's that's what I'm working on now, and I'm really excited about it. I mean, like whatever project I'm working on at the time, you know, you you do something like Mad Men, and you think it's going to happen. Oh, that's what's going to happen. I, and I learned early on in my career that lightning doesn't strike that often. So when it does, you have to enjoy every moment of it. And with Mad Men, I really did. I. There was another time in my life when I was I did a, a play and a movie called Jeffrey. It was an AIDS comedy during the height of the AIDS crisis, written by Paul Rudnick. And then I had the opportunity to reprise my role in the film, and I played opposite Patrick Stewart. In fact, he mentioned me in his in his autobiography that he just wrote. No kidding. It was Patrick Stewart, Sigourney Weaver, Olympia Dukakis, Nathan Lane, Stephen Weber. It was a great cast. Anyway, it's hysterical. At the same time that movie came out, I was in the ensemble of Sunset Boulevard on Broadway, and I was going on for the male lead for Joe Gillis, which is this huge, you know, butch man part. So I'm playing this little dancer queen in this movie, <laughs> and playing this this other great part at the same time. And my one of my friends in the business said, "Because Brian, just enjoy this. You know, just, this doesn't happen all the time. You know, you." you and I'm and I'm trying to make more stuff happen, trying to get people to the theater, and 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 I did enjoy it, but not to the extent where I just really. And so when Mad Men hit, I just said, I remember those words. I said, I'm going to just enjoy this, you know. And I really did. It was I, it was it was the most wonderful experience. So I have no regrets. I have had so much fun, and, and like I said, I'm so grateful for. it. Yeah. I, by the way, I don't know if you can say anything about this, but we also might've heard a little bit of a rumor that you shot a movie this year with a couple of people. I don't know if that's true. I didn't see any confirmation. Yeah, I did one called, what was it? It was called, um, it was at, uh, in Provincetown called The Best Place in the World. Is that it? Yeah. I have it here. Is Bill Irwin and Marissa Tomei? Yeah, Bill Irwin. Yeah. Marissa Tomei. Yeah. It was lovely. I hope that comes out soon. It was a great, great great shoot it was everyone was wonderful and it was bill Irwin's a great guy what a great guy he's um he was so he was so so kind in fact one day as i was going to uh right right was right, right, called on set my husband called and our dog had died and i'm like thank you for telling me this way before i have to come but i i'd only been to provincetown once before and it was crowded and all this stuff and this time i when we were filming it was end of september early October and it was just beautiful. I just, the weather, it was just I could, it was so relaxing and you know, and a couple of days between um, the filming, it was just so much fun. A movie I did um, came out this year too, which I really had fun on called Pinball, The Man That Saved the Game by the Bragg Brothers. And it was really I think take a look at it. I think you might like it. It's set in the seventies and I play an art director. I play an ah. art director I played the art and a real person too, an art director for the GQ magazine circa 1975. So it was, it was fun. It was fun. Character's not named Sal, right? <laughs> yeah, no, he's a little, he's a little Sal. I think he knows more about, I think he's a little more self-knowing than Sal, but um, Mike Feist is the lead. And he was in several things, but most recently he was most known for, he was in the original company of Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway. But he was also Riff in the Spielberg West Side Story. He was quite wonderful in that. He was a wonderful actor and a great, great, great guy. But it, that, that I, lo- I had so much fun on that film, Pinball. And I didn't know Pinball was illegal. In, in, in many, many cities and many states, 
And this was up until the mid 70s that it was illegal in New York City because they thought it was gambling. I, I didn't know this till Licorice Pizza. Isn't that, that wild? Movie. Isn't that crazy? And, you know, it was, it, 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 it's a sweet little film and he's quite wonderful. I have fun. I have one question left, but I think Mike will. Should we, should we do uh, one per person? How are, you, how are you guys feeling about it? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> which one's going to go? <laughs> That's all you will. Well, I feel like we'd be remiss, and I feel like this might be a bad one to end with, but we have kind of built this whole thing about one character in the show named Chauncey. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was coming. <laughs> I was like, please save this for last. <laughs> scenes or interactions with Chauncey, just because I feel like be a service to the podcast we didn't bring him up. Just in case you're not as familiar, because we talk about Chauncey literally every day, he no, was Duck's right? dog. Yeah, it's Duck <laughs> Dog Chauncey. Oh, that scene when he let, that leaves him out in the street? What yeah, the, I know. Yeah. You oh, mentioned that, a spinoff that, with really? Sal, and maybe Sal gets a dog. Yeah, he he dog. Sal and Chauncey forever, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My pal Sal, I mean, who's the... Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I, listen, I'm all for it. Daddy needs a new pair of Gucci's. No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you can agree. I was going to say, Will, if that was really your last question. <laughs> but, oh yeah, Mike, go ahead. All right, Brian, you, you're going back. You get one scene in Mad Men. Who are your scene partners? Who do you want to share that with? Christina. Not a bad choice. Yeah. Not a bad choice at all. I mean, I love the guys, but I just love me for my Christina. I think we would have fun. I went, that scene that we, we did that reading of his play and had the kiss, it was just, she was just... I think she said to me, she says, they really like our chemistry and they were going to maybe have something happen with us, but it never happened. I can't remember the rumor, but, but we, we've remained very close. And I just, look, I, that's, you know, I love them all, but I, I really didn't have much to do with her in the show. I had that one real scene with her like that. The rest were in groups and I would have loved to just have a one on more, a real one on one. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we comment on a lot, especially here in the first three seasons, is it did feel like she gets lost a lot in a lot of the plot lines where there could have been so much more with her specifically. And, and that scene in particular we talked about with, with mm -hmm. Sal. So, yeah, interesting to hear that you have the, the similar perspective. Yeah, no, I, I adore her. I, I just adore her. My last question, and a little bit of a fun one. I know you're a big fan of music. I know you love television, but music for sure is a passion of yours. What's what's something maybe you should be listening to that's been kind of, you know, one of, one of your go-tos lately? Oh, <laughs> I'm so old. Um, I, my, you know, pop music right now, is, God, you know, I would. the last thing I put on was the Pandora Squeeze Station, you know, the group Squeeze from the 80s. So it would play like Elvis Costello and Squeeze and all these other new wave groups that were like kind of my my go to in the eighties and nineties and, and but I, I wish I would be more you know with it and say you know Taylor Swift no I'm kidding <laughs> which I don't understand I don't I mean look she's fantastic right? you know and all this stuff but I don't understand why on my Facebook feed every other thing is like she and, and the guy counselor, I mean the boyfriend from the Chiefs I'm like every two seconds like I didn't join a fan club I'm yeah. not you know, all of a sudden this algorithm and then now they start sending I get all these things of Sylvester Stallone like I haven't seen a Rocky movie since you know Rocky 2 or eight, back in the 80s I haven't seen I don't understand how this all works I wish there's something I could plug in to change these algorithms because something will pop up that I like you know it'll try to get me with something I like you know whether it's you know a dog or you know whatever kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, then it'll turn radical right wing shit. And I'm like, I didn't sign up for this. So, you know, my husband got the right idea. He got off of Facebook. Do you, do you have, do you have like the Spotify, like unwrapped or anything that ever, you ever get that kind of thing? No, I'm so bad at this. I'm really, I, I have to call one of my nieces to come in and just, you know, get me up to date. I still keep a date book, you know, nice, and, nice. And, you know, it's like. I'm old school. I just, I got to get with it. You know, I know my phone could do my taxes, but I just don't know. I was going to say though, as we leave it, that you just, you just came up with the show. My pal Sal, he's battling <laughs> all the, all the marketing ploys that current technology has given us and bringing us back to the, to the <laughs> yeah. old school. Yeah. 
Yeah, that there it is. That's the plot. That's the that's I like that. That's the okay. So yeah, who do we call? <laughs> I mean, we took it. It took only short of an hour. I feel like that's a good foundation, but. Uh, <laughs> Brian, we can't we can't thank you enough, honestly, for taking the time, especially since you work so much and you you had so much going on this year. It's a true honor just just to hang out with you for a bit. Yeah, I'm easy. I'm easy, but thank you, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for liking the show so much to have a podcast on it. It's you know, it is one of my favorite things I've, I've had the pleasure of doing. You know, it's people like you to keep it going. So thanks, because I haven't gone back and watched it in forever. Literally, I mean, I've only watched. I think I've seen it all once, maybe twice. I had to go through stuff, you know, put scenes on reels for agents and stuff like that. But, you know, maybe one day I'll, I'll, because I I have to have this foot surgery. I'll be, I'll be laid up for a little bit. I might just go back. and. Well, if you do, there's this great companion podcast that you can listen to after every episode. (laughs) (laughs) You may not want to. I know it can be hard to like watch yourself in things, but I I suppose it's a little bit easier when you're a really great actor and maybe that softens it. There's there's a couple of moments that I I, I catch you know, like like oh why did I do that oh god you know there's one little moment at the bar in that in that hobo code thing I go to get my cigarette and I change my mind I can't remember how it I didn't pull it out or it was just and it really bothered me I'm like going, why did they keep that take there were other takes that, but you know I think as an actor you always just look at all I see is the flaws all I see is you know oh my god you know you're old now what you know or you know it, it, I only, it's hard. It's really hard listening to myself and all that stuff. That's why live theaters is, is great because you, it's out there and it's done. It's ephemeral. 